Hello, and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists. I'm your host, Raina Andrews, and for those of you tuning in for the first time, let me introduce yourself myself, excuse me. I'm a mother, a children's book author, a public health ambassador, a TEDx speaker, and just really an engaged and concerned community member. I'm happy to return as your host of Coffee Conversations with Scientists for the 2024 season. Um, so that you know, since 2021, we have been sharing the science behind today's most important health topics. Coffee Conversations is brought to you by the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, a st statewide nonprofit working to improve health and advance health equity and the Medical College of Wisconsin. So today we are decoding the dynamic dance between artificial intelligence and healthcare and really unveiling how cutting edge advancements are transforming patient care. And to help us with this conversation, we have our resident expert, Dr. Bradley Crotty, who is the chief digital officer at Freighter in the Medical College of Wisconsin. He's the chief medical officer and interim president for Inception Health, and he's an associate professor of medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Welcome, Dr. Crotty. Good morning, Raina. So happy to be here with everybody. Yes. yes. And so for those of you tuning in for the first time, Coffee Conversations with Scientists is live stream, which means you have an opportunity to participate. So just let me get through this first trudge of questions, and then we will turn it over to you to ask the questions that are important to you. And so let's get started. So Dr. Crotty, can you share with me, you know, people have different thoughts about what technology, what AI is, just to level the playing field of what we're talking about here. Can you share or provide brief overview of how artificial intelligence is currently being used in a healthcare setting? Yeah, ab absolutely. Let me just take a little bit of a step back and talk about what artificial intelligence is and is not. And then I think that can ground us in the, in the conversation that we can have. So if we can think about defining AI, and we see this term all over the place right now, uh, AI is a form of advanced computing and mathematics that at face value, you're unable to determine whether you're talking to a machine or another person. That was that's, that's a so-called uh, Turing test developed by Alan Turing in the 1950s to define what is artificial intelligence, that sort of ability to think and reason uh, like a person, but coming from a uh, machine. Now, AI can be further sub subdivided into narrow AI that's like very purpose specific, and then artificial general uh, artificial general intelligences, which what we think about as robots that can think and react uh, similar to, to humans. In healthcare, we have a lot more narrow AI. So these are examples where advanced computing is helping uh, scientists create new molecules based on molecular structure or rapidly comb through a medical chart or to look at a medical image. One example we might have is you might have computer assisted mammograms where a computer is over reading the uh, scan and it's been trained on a data set of mammograms that have been labeled as those uh, at risk or suspicious for cancer and those are that are not suspicious of cancer or having cancer. And that is an example of our narrow artificial intelligence. It's just very specific to, uh, to that data set. And we've had those in medicine from time to time over the over the years. Now, the thing that's more exciting or cap captiva captiva uh, captivating the imagination of everybody is artificial general intelligence. And this is this concept that a machine can think and reason and take information in, reason with it, and then provide an output just as a, as a human would. And we're not there yet with artificial general intelligence, but we're getting closer. And and just if I may, have you have you experienced, have you played with chat GPT or or BARD or any of those models yet, Raina? I have. I have. Yeah. So so these are kind of game game changers. Um and the T in GPT stands for transformer. Now it's not quite like the cartoon or the toy transformer, but it's it's a it's it's a language transformer in, in a way. And these models they're also referred to as language models and more generalized models. But what they do is they understand language really, really well. 
and exactly how they work at the very, very fine detail is not entirely known, which is actually very scientifically interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but what they do is they can take language and then make sense out of it, um, or at least be able to predict the next phrase to return to you. And that language can be English, it can be Spanish, but there's all kinds of languages in nature. So DNA in itself is a language. Pixels on a computer screen are a language. Binary code is a language. And so the computer can also take those in and understand and then again, predict the next uh, in the what would happen next or what it should say next. Now, getting closer to artificial general intelligence, wouldn't it be neat if you could take the medical chart and all of the documentation that's in there, and you could take some medical images that you have, and you might take a DNA sequence, and you had a challenging clinical case, and have a computer kind of put all of those together. And, and that's what we're on the cusp of, of being able to uh, have available to us. It's going to take some time to work out all the details, um, but that's that's kind of the optimistic future that I have about 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 this technology. This is exciting. So I, I, I was really I'm I have been really looking forward to my conversation with you, Dr. Crotty, because <clears throat> when I go into the doctor's office, outside of my chart and just the doctor manually entering the information into the system, I'm not really sure how AI shows up in, in, in the clinical setting. Can you can you share what maybe I I'm overlooking or how AI shows up in healthcare? So one of the earliest examples of AI uh, showing up in healthcare, again, a very narrow use of AI and a narrow use case is in EKG reading. So uh, the uh, EKG that you're hooked up to the electrodes and it takes the EKG or sometimes ECG electrocardiogram, a computer can take that and interpret that information and provide some clinical information back uh, to the to the clinician. Um, you know, in the beginning, uh, we were always told as, uh, you know, in medical school, actually, don't look at the computer's interpretation, fold that part over and read it yourself. So you really understand that and you can check the computer, uh, you can check the computer's work. And that's still a bit, a bit to that extent. But, you know, being able to kind of parse through long monitors uh, is where AI is currently in the system. I, I mentioned mammography and we've had this computer aided detection. It's getting a lot more sophisticated now to be able to look at lung, lung nodules or to be able to look at head scans and be able to detect whether there might be a stroke or risk of stroke and be able to flag that. So so that those are some of those cases. I, I think where you're more likely to see it and experience it though, at least in 2024, uh, will be just walking into your, your doctor's office and you might see a, uh, a phone or a tablet laying on the desk and with your permission, it might be uh, recording your conversation and then taking all those bits of pieces that you have of dialogue and then putting them right into the medical record in the right spot. And uh, that that's probably the newer uh, change that, that people will be experiencing uh, right now. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'm most excited about is really in the evolution advancement of technology is just better health outcomes. And so can you share um, how AI is contributing to this, maybe in the space of healthcare administration, diagnostics, patient care? Yeah, one, one of the uh, challenges that we have in, in healthcare, we've had, we've known this is, this is coming for a while, but it, it's, there's gonna be a nursing shortage, there's gonna be a, there's a, certainly a primary care shortage. And I think one of the things that, and we can maybe talk about this a little bit later, but one of the things I'm most excited about is where we can use technology to help fill in those gaps. It's not going to replace, um, but definitely can help support uh, patients. We have a kind of a, a pyramid. And the way I kind of think about this care pyramid is that at the bottom is patient and self-management. At the top is uh, sort of the middle is coaching. And at the very top is professional care services. And this is where you see a clinician, you see a pharmacist uh, for medical advice. Um, but, you know, in, in healthcare, like from us as a healthcare system or the healthcare organization, we focus on the very top level but patients spend their lives at home, not in the in the clinician's office. Um, and 
some of the initial use cases that we have right now are uh, providing data and information and insights with guardrails uh, for patients to be able to manage things uh, at at home um, and to help them, uh, excuse me. So we have remote patient monitoring examples where someone may be managing diabetes at home or managing high blood pressure at home. And we will start to have AI and some of this advanced computing help support the patient, but then it'll still be uh, supervised by a, a human. So those are some examples where we're starting to uh, to see AI uh, there. Um, <clears throat> there's also, uh, you know, some more on, on the cutting edge and research, but it's starting to work its way into, into clinical practice. Um, I mean, have you ever had a, a doctor look in the back of your eye? Yeah. I imagine you, you've had, right? So, you know, what, what, why is the doctor or the clinician looking in the, in the back of the eye? I mean, they, it's a great way to see what the blood vessels uh, are. Are they healthy? The optic nerve, part of the brain, uh, is that looking healthy? Um, and particularly with people with conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes, you can start to see changes, you know, that are consequences of, of those disease states. <laughs> Now, there's some very interesting things, though, if you take a picture of the back of the eye and you let a computer train on it and uh, it can make conclusions that the human can't make. Um, and there's been research showing that just being able to look at a photograph of the back of the eye, you could predict the blood pressure of the person. <clears throat> you could... Uh, predict a cardiovascular risk with the same degree or similar degree of accuracy as taking a cholesterol panel, for example. So those are kind of more exciting ways where we might be able to expand the the diagnostics and non, you know, doesn't take a, a blood test to look in the back of the eye there um, in a way that's just much more accessible to, to people. So that's going to be really cool. You know, there have been great advancements in artificial intelligence within the healthcare clinical setting. I'm just wondering, do you have can you provide us with a sense of how how are some of the patients taking this? What is some of their feedback then? Well, let me start with the example of the ambient documentation because um, I think, again, like I said, this is going to be something that people are going to see in their clinicians' offices uh, across the country. Uh, now it's being integrated into the electronic health records, and you know the. General, when I uh, introduced the topic uh, as, as one of the early adopters of this technology, I would introduce the topic and share with the patient that I'm uh, uh, putting the device on the table, it records, and it helps me uh, make my notes. For the for the most part, patients are appreciative and welcoming of it. Of course, it has all of the security uh, and data privacy safeguards as the rest of their uh, electronic health information. But generally, patients are welcoming because it's helping me do their job to care for them better. It's helping me to capture all of the details and make sure I, I get them into my documentation and, and my and my notes. And it serves as a reference point. So of course, I encourage my patients to go online and read their notes after I, I make them. So they they definitely can go back and and see the uh, you know that what they said was captured there. And occasionally I will get someone who is concerned about uh, their privacy and will say, um, you know, I understand that, you know, that's uh, being, uh, you know, safeguarded with data security protocols, but, you know, I still want to keep our conversation, our, our conversation. And that's something that, you know, we will continue to respect, of, of course. And there's always the, I want this off the record, which, um, you know, is a discussion between the patient and the, and the clinician, what can and cannot be off the record. But, uh, you know, we'll encounter those uh, from time to time as well. Mm -hmm. So as, as a patient myself, I would, I can understand where, pe where, where people have concerns around um, navigating issues of data privacy and ethical concerns, who can see my information, even, even with systems like my chart, I wonder who can see my information? Can you just share a bit about some of the stop gaps and some of the privacy protections in place? Let me just mention that you are are not alone in this. You know, who can actually see my my information? Um, when we did a, a project a, a couple of years ago called um, Open Notes, what we did is we did an experiment that uh, invited patients to read their notes that their doctors were writing about them. 
And then we surveyed patients and doctors at the beginning of the year and at the end of the end of the uh, end of the year. And the most common concern that we had from patients was around privacy. Like one out of four patients said, you know, I'm I really like this, but I'm concerned around around privacy. What are you doing for the the privacy and and safeguards? And so when I think about information privacy, we certainly have administrative and legal protections as well as technical protections and safeguards. So from an administrative protection, the law says that no one should be looking at a medical charter record who doesn't have a right to, to do so. Um, and you know, across the, the country, uh, you'll see examples where people are um, uh, lose their jobs if they're looking at records that they have no business looking at. I mean, it's very serious. It's audited uh, and it everything is is looked at. So that's from the professional on the clinical on the clinical side of of things. Um, on the patient side of things, the, it's up to the patient to determine who can read their record or read their information. And patients can determine uh, whether a proxy member, like a family member, like it could be a spouse, it could be a parent, it could be a a, a child, can have access to that to that information. Um, and there's a lot of research and a lot of work evolving in that in that data uh, privacy um, space. One of the things I I also because it, you know it's worth mentioning um, you know there's a lot of legal safeguards around around healthcare data, um, but there are legally permit permissible ways to to share uh, data uh, generally with like insurance companies, you know, for example. But all of those are. Uh, have very strict legal agreements around who can share what, when, and for what purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I can understand that. Um, and it's 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 helpful for me to better understand these safeguards around my information, my personal information. And I'm often curious on, as AI continues to play a larger role in healthcare, just thinking about what challenges or considerations healthcare professionals need to address. And the first thing that comes to mind is our own inher an inherent bias. So how do we address AI bias in the healthcare setting? Yeah, that's a great question. And and um, it's actually directly related to this concept of sharing data uh, and uh, how to properly do that. Um, so I, I like that you mentioned we do have humans have uh, biases, implicit biases, um, and it's you know if if they are acknowledged, uh, one can you know address and mitigate them. And same thing with with the computers. Um, computers are only as good as and these AI models are only as good as the data that are trained on them. And data sets have biases in them, particularly healthcare data. We don't routinely collect a lot of healthcare uh, data on people who are healthy. A lot of our data that are in electronic health records, for example, are from people who are are sick. We also um, ha have populations that are underrepresented in many data sets, particularly research data sets, where uh, it may be difficult to recruit patients or to include patients um, for multiple reasons from underrepresented um, backgrounds, and you'll see that the uh, NIH and other the National Institutes of Health and others, you know, really specify that you know research needs to have a plan for making sure that people are included uh, in research because if they're not, uh, their data are not going to be available, and so this can directly translate into the um, you know algorithm performance if we have a. a a patient uh, from a, a group that is underrepresented in the data, you know, the results may not apply to them and you may be getting a, a wrong record. And there have been some some fairly famous examples where, uh, you know, taking data at face value without really understanding how the data were used or how they were collected can give you the wrong answer. And um, sometimes that can be a, you know, a pretty bad uh, wrong answer. So from the extent, you know, there's a couple of ways that we need to to look at this. One is make sure that, you know, as an academic organization, that we are very inclusive with uh, with people and data, and we encourage people um, and we treat their data, make sure that it is is safe. But we encourage them to add their data in. So examples of like the All of Us uh, research initiative that the Medical College uh, of Wisconsin. Uh, has been participating in is important. There are other examples of that where we're really trying to get an inclusive uh, data set on people um, 
so that results are not going to be biased. And then at the um, at the organizational level, I will say, when we're looking at algorithms that can help augment care, provide some decision support, we have checklists and we work through where was, you know, how was this data obtained that uh, it was trained on? How did you validate it? Does this, does the patient population that we want this to apply, does it include all of the, the patients included in the, in the training data? So these are, um, these are steps that you cannot shortcut. You can't just take it off the shelf from some algorithm that someone created in another part of the country and then plug it in and expect it's going to work. It needs to be locally validated and locally assessed. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are some of the ways that we can uh, work on mitigating uh, the bias in the in the healthcare data. As a as a as a patient, I think one of the questions that you could always ask is, as a clinician when you're aware that a a model or risk prediction is being used is say, well, how does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. And uh, and have that conversation. I I appreciate that response not only from the side of the patient. How can you advocate for yourself, but also in gathering the data so that you don't have to have a variance for exceptions to the results mm -hmm. that come out. Um, let's turn to our audience now. We have a, a quite active chatty group here. And one of the questions has to do with bias and the data collection. The first question is, do you have any examples of how AI is helping to bring healthcare to typically underserved populations? Yeah, that's a great uh, example. So I. Um... So one of the use cases of the um, I mentioned the looking at the on the back of the eye. This is um, work done by uh, well, it's been academic work shared by uh, Google research team. They're, they're of course very active in the AI and healthcare um, space as well. But they're trying to take this technology and bring it to developing countries um, because you can get so much information in a in a fairly uh, inexpensive uh, way, in a non-invasive way uh, for being able to do screening. So that's like a really good example where the technology can uh, actually help uh, with the health outcomes, particularly for uh, more vulnerable uh, populations or patients that wouldn't otherwise have access to the sort of full suite of, of technology. I'm also very hopeful that uh, we can take the knowledge and all of the information that has been obtained and we're continuing to work through and refine and then be able to bring it to people in a way that is a is almost like a healthcare companion or like a you know like a helpful uh assistant um we have very important uh you know structural barriers to receiving healthcare uh particularly in this country but definitely worldwide as as well and that can be insurance and costs and access and transportation um and if we can think about ways where we can, um, while doing it it's, it's safely, um, uh, bring some of this knowledge to people. Again, the kind of the bottom rung of the pyramid that I was talking about where people are living their lives with their family and navigating, I'm more optimistic that we'll, we'll actually be able to have better, uh, better health outcomes. It all can't be uh, going to the clinician and then executing. It really needs to be you know, on a more regular, routine basis fit for the goals that, uh, that a person or a, a group of people have. Um, in the vein of, again, AI bias and, and what's being done, the next audience member is asking, what happens in a scenario where AI makes an error or produces incorrect information and how can that be avoided? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. It's, it's one of the, um, I want to say that like, this is a, a very uh, fast evolving area. Um, and we are a member of a large group of healthcare systems that we're all working through uh, some of these applications together. Um, and this is also all happening in real time where particularly the federal government is um, also issuing new regulations around how to use artificial intelligence within the healthcare uh, space. And so just about every uh, branch of the uh, executive government, uh, um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Food and Drug Administration, uh, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, uh, you know, so on and so forth, uh, are creating uh, guidance. So this is a rapidly evolving area. The legal question is a very interesting one, like who is responsible uh, 
for that. Right now, uh, you know, humans supervise the the information. So just as we would use any other calculator or program, a clinician at the end uh, is responsible for making those decisions with the with the healthcare uh, team. Um, issues or topics to bring up that are, I think, would be very valuable to discuss are, you know, talking with patients about the use of AI technology uh, with them. And do we have in, in something like an informed consent process? Or, or is this just evolving so fast that it's just part of care? And just as we've always used mathematical models to determine someone's uh, hemoglobin level, and this is just another example of of that. Um, those are just very interesting uh, questions that will uh, that will um, that will unfold. So, what I'm taking away from that is that healthcare in general is highly regulated, and so the advancements and the rapid advancements of AI is being closely monitored and watched. And so, there are protocols in place on what to do in the in the onset of some type of variance in, in AI output. Yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, and we want to move one um, at pace that is um, responsible. And so we've set up um, processes that provide checks and balances. Um, there are are folks who have you know, helped advocate the field of like these algorithms uh, should have almost like nutrition labels to to sort of show what they're made of and and how they should be used. Um, and then again, like I said, we we locally validate uh, all of these and and things can change over time. There's this concept of of drift in in algorithm performance. So these things need to be monitored. so we we need to set up a and I see health systems doing this, like taking a very deliberate approach to, set the foundation um at the at the same time um you know these they these can provide help uh today uh and so we want to make sure that we're not uh, too slow because the, these these can be you know very helpful um to people not in an abstract sense but in a very real uh sense so we want to tr try to strike that balance so we have time for about two more questions, um, Dr. Crotty, and there's a, a long list of questions here that people are asking. But I do want to ask as a follow-up to um, how we may see AI in the, in the clinical setting, um, what happens to those recorded visit conversations after the provider um, takes the notes? Is it sent it to your electronic record? Is it deleted? What happens to that? Uh, right now, um, using one of the more common uh, uh, tools, um, the conversation is transcribed. And so there's a, a transcript of the conversation and then it's put into different components of the note. If you read your notes, you might see that there's a section for the history. Um, and this is the history that you as a, as a patient uh, will provide a, a section for objective findings, like this is describing the physical examination and then an assessment, uh, assessment and plan, which are what the clinician uh, determines is uh, the diagnoses and what our plan of, of treatment is. And so the computer algorithm will put parts of the note together using all of the different data. So you may talk about one issue, second issue, third issue, and it puts it into that note. I think over over time, uh, you know, the technology companies are working on then making those as suggested orders. And so if we said in the uh, transcript that well, the blood pressure is a little high, so let's start a let's start uh, hydrochlorothiazide, twenty five milligrams once daily. And I said that verbally, that it would then take that and tee it up as an order and said, I think you suggested that you wanted to start this medicine. And again, that it's helping reduce the number of clicks and increase that presence between patient and clinician in the office. Um, and so those are some of the things that are coming down the, the road for this type of technology. And after that, the, the note is, uh, is discarded and it goes into the electronic health record, but the transcription is, uh, is then discarded. The transcription is discarded. So, and so the audio recorded. recording is just discarded. Got it. But like the but the note, medicine. but the note, okay. yeah. the finished note that the that the that the provider, the clinician, looks at, adds, edits, and then signs off on, stays as part of the health record as as usual. 
So just, I, I, I'll, I'm going to try and squeeze in this one last question because I think it's very important and it's rather personal to one of our listeners. And so they ask, what advantages can artificial intelligence have or make to assist with making better outcomes for people living day to day with cancerous tumors that negatively impact not cognitive abilities and execute an, an executive function? So basically yeah, this person yeah. is living with a cancerous tumor and it's having a cognitive impact. How can AI assist in something like this? There's a number of different different ways in the in the let's talk the the healthcare setting first, where we're starting to see AI is particularly in cancer, is helping to uh, one identify uh, the diagnosis identify appropriate treatments based on the particular type of cancer and subtype of cancer and genetic profile. And so we're going to be seeing more of this over time. This, the field just evolves so rapidly that we need the computers to help us you know, make sense of all of the Im information. And so that's, that's something that we'll be, we'll be seeing. And I, I think also you know, part of this is how can I use AI to help me with my, my day-to-day tasks? And, in these ways, these language models can now be created to almost be personal guides or assistants. Think about the very early version of the um, Alexas and series. They could do short commands, but they couldn't really keep a conversation with us or advise us. And, and some of these new language models can do that. And, um, you know, we could, one could imagine asking the, uh, you know, the BARD or the chat GPT or the, the Microsoft co-pilot being, um, take your pick, like, how can I best prepare for this, uh, this doctor's visit? Or what are the questions I want to ask? And, and actually have a, a dialogue almost with the computer and then use that as a way to prepare for a, a visit. So there's increasingly ways where we'll be able to use this technology to help us, not just in the clinical part, but definitely on the on the living part as well. Yes. So unfortunately, with that, we are at time, but I really appreciate your feedback, your knowledge, and helping expand our thinking of how AI is used in the healthcare setting. I had no idea the distinction between narrow artificial intelligence and artificial and general intelligence, but I appreciate as we went on, you increasing our knowledge by giving examples of what this is. And so for those of you who are out there that have additional questions or have topics you'd like to explore, please feel free to send me a note at conversations at mcw.edu. Dr. Crotty, we really appreciate your time with the many hats that you wear. We know your time is in demand, so thank you. Thank you so much. It was so fun to be here. Yes. Well, and for those of you out there, we hope to see you again for another con coffee conversation with scientists. Have a good day.